Hey guys, before we begin, I just want to let you know, I was having mic troubles filming this video, so the volume is not consistent throughout the video. Also, we're talking about an event that does not have a lot of photographic evidence pertaining to it, so there are going to be large stretches in this video where I'm talking and it's just the Readout Productions logo, so just bear with me on it. Uh, hopefully what I'm talking about is interesting. Well, on to the video. Hey guys, welcome to Readout Productions. We're here in Lilly, Pennsylvania to talk about an event for this tour video that I didn't know about until about 48 hours ago. Now most history is taught through misconceptions for the sake of convenience. Most schools do this just to save time and it's not necessarily an evil thing, it's just that they don't have time to go in detail on every little detail per decade. Take for example the Roaring Twenties. We're often taught in schools of some image of some flappers in the basement of a speakeasy, having a party, drinking beer, and it defiance of prohibition. Unfortunately, the Roaring Twenties was not that pretty. It began with the largest insurrection in American history since the Civil War and ended with the stock market crash of 1929. Here in Lilly, Pennsylvania, if dealt with one of the darkest issues in American history, which is still unfortunately going on today, hatred. On April 5th, 1924, about 400 Klansmen stormed Lilly, Pennsylvania, which was predominantly made up of an immigrant population. By the end of the day, three people would be dead, with only 20 other wounded. This is the story of the Lilly KKK riots. You might be thinking, Klan in Pennsylvania? Isn't that a Southern problem? Like I said, history is taught in misconceptions for the sake of convenience. The original iteration of the Klan was formed shortly after the end of the American Civil War to try and upend reconstruction of the southern states. They used fear tactics to terrify and brutalize newly emancipated African Americans, aiming to keep them fearful of going to the ballot boxes. By the 1870s, the federal government were partially successful in mitigating the Klan as a powerful force, but the damage had already been done, as state governments imposed restrictive laws that put much of the black population into a quasi-state between freedom and the former life of slavery. Fast forward to the 20th century, as immigration is on the rise. The Klan reforms not only to oppress the black population, but also any group that wasn't what they deemed pure, like the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant they viewed themselves as. It didn't help the fact that the D.W. DW Griffith film, Birth of a Nation, was released in 1915, glorifying the actions of the KKK and dehumanizing African Americans. The Klan morphed into being very public in the early 20s, with chapters hosting community picnics and even having their own paper, The Keystone American. The hate group knew how to appeal to the downtrodden working-class Americans, not only in the Deep South, but northern states as well. In fact, it's believed by the start of the 1920s that there were over 125,000 members in the Klan in Pennsylvania alone. Pennsylvania had become the epicenter of industry by the turn of the 20th century, with coal and coke being shipped out of the mountains to the steel mills in Pittsburgh, all connected by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Hundreds of towns popped up right off the tracks and were often bordered by the tipples of mines. Lilly was no exception, with an estimated population in 1920 at over 2,000. Founded by German immigrants a century prior, the town didn't really find life until the railroad managed to traverse the Allegheny Mountain. The railroad required fierce manpower to lay and maintain the tracks and locomotives, bringing in immigrants from all walks of life in Europe. Around this time, Lilly was predominantly populated by Italian immigrants, first-generation descendants of Irish immigrants, and Polish immigrants. Although the first wave of immigrants were brought over purely for the railroad, most were now employed by the various coal companies in the region. Over 90% of Lilly were Catholics of some kind, with the remaining fraction of Protestants dedicated to the Lutheran church in town. To sum it up, Lilly was a town with a 90% Catholic population at the time was predominantly populated by Italian, Polish, and Irish immigrants and had on numerous occasions stood up to the Klan. Not to mention it was also a stronghold for the United Mine Workers. It is because of these reasons that a target had been put on this sleepy community and things were about to get very ugly. In 1923, 25,000 Klansmen attempted to storm Carnegie, Pennsylvania, but were turned away by a united front of townspeople, immigrants, and longtime residents. Violence continued to erupt wherever the Klan went. 
Entering into 1924, the local chapters of the United Mine Workers were not going to tolerate such actions. The district Lilly resided in announced earlier that year any UMW worker found to be with the KKK would be expelled from the Union. Although the organization as a whole wouldn't adopt this new code of ethics until later in the year, the local clans been viewed it as some sort of opening shot in their crusade against the un-American. In February, a cross burning was attempted during a local dance in South Fork. Several tend to dance at night were miners from Lilly, who were not going to allow for a peaceful gathering be ruined and took it upon themselves to topple the cross before it could be burned. Things escalated on the night of March 21st, 1924. Someone approached the parsonage of Lilly's Lutheran Church and sprayed it with gunfire. Two Italian workers were arrested in a nearby Italian-owned store. Many believed the two men had been framed by the KKK. Protestant and Catholic relations in the area became increasingly strained as April approached. This is going to bring us to the events of April 5th, 1924. We're currently standing where the Lilly Station would have been at the time of the event. And I want to set the picture. It's a Saturday, cool spring air. The miners are going about their usual businesses up in the mines, but had the promise later today of seeing the girls' basketball game playoff. The girls' basketball team of Lilly was actually in Evansburg this day getting their photo taken. This was, in fact, the inaugural season for this team. Philip Conrad, age 24, was a scorekeeper and would be heading to the gymnasium shortly after his shift in the mines. It wasn't a job he particularly loved, but had no other choice after being laid off by the Pennsylvania Railroad the year prior. Lilly's chief of police at the time was Dave George, who was most likely still at edge after arresting the two Italians for the shooting on the parsonage. He hoped he had put that all behind and could look forward to service at the Lutheran Church the next day. Some in town may have no noticed the tall stature of Chloe Paul pulling fallen trees into the clearing of Piper's Field, overlooking the town. And to give you a perspective, Piper's Field is no longer there today. It is up there on the hillside covered by houses. Based on the troublesome account that I'll later talk about, 22-year-old uh, Frank Misco was probably working somewhere near the city, leaving his 16-year-old Polish wife at home here in Lilly. Gerald Carney was the youngest of three brothers and was probably the only one still getting enough of the childish things in life. His father had passed away three years earlier. The general consensus around the town was pleasant, only marred by those who found the hate-filled Keystone American sitting in the newsstand of one of the stores. The peace was broken at 6.15 p.m. when the evening train arrived here at Lilly Station, bringing several residents home. Among them were Misco himself, who gave a chilling account of hundreds of Klansmen moving upon Lilly. Back over in Johnstown, there were about 300 Klansmen boarding a rented-out train car consisting of tra and passenger cars, which was dubbed the KKK Special. Two other trains would be boarded that day. These men would be carrying brown packages, which were concealing their hoods and costumes. The KKK Special departed from Johnstown, picking up supporters at several stops before arriving here in Lilly at 7 p.m. 400 Klansmen would have gathered in this rough spot. Their goal was to march up to Piper's Field, which I pointed out earlier, hopefully in the video. At the time, the town was initially probably deserted. Most people did not want to be out of the streets. They were trying to avoid any trouble. Then around 7.15, the power was cut to the town. And we really don't know to this day who cut the power. Most likely it was a sympathizer with the Klan. Now the Klan would have marched up Cleveland Street, which is off to, uh, off to your right right now. And as they made their way to the corner of Cleveland and Porter Street, which Porter Street is no longer there, it's abandoned, they would have been making the left, passing the Lutheran Church. So while the Klan were passing the church, a small crowd of women had gathered and were in fact cheering on the behalf of the hooded procession. Most of them were teenager Protestant girls, including 18-year-old Esper Hannah and 16-year-old sister Anna. Within moments, however, a mob of townspeople angry at the Klan would have begun making their way down toward Cleveland Street. Philip's, uh, Philip Conrad had just stepped out of the gymnasium trying to figure out why the power was out in town and ultimately had to rush in and grab Esper, who had been thrown to the ground by the townspeople, her ankle broken, and Philip would have carried Esper to a nearby porch to safety. 
that a clan went up to Piper's Field, and for a two-hour ceremony that included burning of two crosses, included detonation of dynamite, and I'm sure a lot of singing and chanting that was terrifying the townspeople. Now, while all this is transpiring, uh, the townspeople are going to be back down here in the dark. They're fed up, and they wanted some way to uh, send a message back toward the clan. Initial ideas called for cutting uh, the coal hoppers up at the mines and let them run into the train that was parked here at Lily Station. That idea was quickly shot down because they did not want anybody getting harmed. And instead, Frank Misco was probably the one that proposed the idea of using the fire hose, hecking up to the hydrant, which the original is not there anymore, but you probably saw the hydrant as we walked past and doused the clan as they marched back toward the station. The clan didn't get down around, uh, didn't get done with their ceremonies till about 9.30. So the clan did not return until about 9.30. They marched down the way they came, North Street to Porter Street, and then onto Cleveland. We're onto Cleveland right now. As they would be marching, the townspeople had gathered on either side of Cleveland Street. Uh, probably every profanity in the Europe and European languages was tossed their way. And eventually, they're going to get down to where you see the blue fire hydrant. Frank Misco would have been gathered with a crew frantically trying to tie the hose into the fire hydrant. Sam Evans, a Klansman from South Fork, approached Misco. There was a confrontation. And as Misco uh, let loose of the water. Uh, some accounts say that the water really didn't spray. There was not enough pressure, and that leads me to believe that they were probably frantically tying the hose on, and probably water was leaking out, and the hose didn't get all of the water, and only the rear end of the column had been sprayed. Sam Evans approached Misco, charged him, pulling out a pistol. The townspeople would have been frantically trying to flee back, and a shot rings out. Next thing you know, the whole street erupts with gunfire. Misco is going to be shot for the torso, falls. Coyd Paul is going to be shot, and he's going to be killed right here in the street. As the shooting ranges on, we know that there was shooting in return, uh, from both sides. We know that some of the townspeople, it appears they had guns, firing back the way of the clan. The shooting went on for about two minutes. Helen Conrad, who was only nine at the time, would remember recalling of the event, describing the shooting as sounding like roller skates. And this whole street, by the way, was brick at the time. So you can imagine the bullets pinging off the brick sounding like roller skates. Eventually, the Klansmen were charged back toward the station boarded their train back to Johnstown, and while they were leaving, tossing their firearms all out, trying to dispose of evidence. And days later, police would be finding pistols and firearms from here to Johnstown. Within two minutes, as we mentioned, Misco had been shot for the torso. He'd been carried off to safety. Coyd Paul lay dead in the street. Phil Conrad, who had been two blocks up Cleveland Street, is, was not involved with the actual shooting, but a bullet had hit him. He had been carried to a nearby jewelry store where he would die half an hour later. So three people were killed in the shooting with another two, uh, 20 men and women injured. When the KKK special returned to Johnstown late at night, police were waiting on the platform. Each coach would be thoroughly searched. Anyone found still with their weapons were arrested. The press quickly got hold of snippets of what had happened in Lilly, with the shooting making headlines on national papers such as the New York Times. The rush of information, however, left little time to clarify what had really gone down. Mescal was interviewed from his hospital bed by reporters who publicized the account as fact, ignoring that the poor man was in intense pain and soon to be dead. The confusing timeline Misco gave on his deathbed only made things harder for the investigation. In a few days of the shooting, state police would have to be called in to secure Lily, patrolling the perimeter of the borough for the next week. The investigative work included walking the tracks and trying to recover as many of the disposed pistols that could be found. But when it came to trying the arrest of the perpetrators, the boiling tensions between Catholics and Protestants in the area led to irrational charges. 
In all, 28 Klansmen and 15 townspeople would be charged for crimes of rioting, affray, and unlawful assembly. Several townspeople that were charged would claim later that they were far from the actual shooting. Carney was among those wrongfully accused, with the only grain of evidence used against him being the testimony from Chief George claiming Carney had discharged a gun at the scene. But Carney would spend the rest of his life claiming he had never possessed a firearm. When the townspeople of Lilly tried to put forward charges of murder against Sam Evans, the Klan countered by threatening to charge Lilly resident William Monaghan with murder. The arrested townspeople were advised to invoke their Fifth Amendment right, standing solidly behind Monaghan. This show of unity came at the price of omitting key testimonies as evidence in the inevitable trial. When the time came for the fight to be taken to the Cambria County Court of Common Pleas, no judge wished to get involved with such a volatile situation. Judge Thomas E. Finletter was brought from Philadelphia to oversee the trial. Getting an impartial jury was next to impossible. To make matters more murky, appeals by both the Klan and townspeople to be tried separately were denied, meaning when the trial commenced in June of 1924, there were a slew of lawyers all jammed in, defending for both Lilly and the Klan were on the same side against the state of Pennsylvania. With invoking the Fifth Amendment, neither Klansmen or townspeople took to the witness stand to defend themselves. Only witnesses pulled by the state added color to the chain of events, with said interrogations on the witness stand being continually interrupted by Finletter. Worsening the situation was that only those arrested in Johnstown were ever tried. Later testimonies reveal many more Klansmen had fled by getting off at other stations and slipping out of the radar of justice. Carney would later believe a deal had been brokered between the various parties and the state to allow for four married men of the accused to be released for the sum of $7,000, which today would be around $80,000. Finletter's perception of the case was that all were guilty until proven otherwise, a notion that was a complete inversion of most common plea courts. The final decision came down to what Finletter described as the important thing in the offense of riot is the violation of the public peace. If both sides violate that, they can be properly charged with the violation. The Klansmen, because they insulted by their parade, and the others, because they yielded to the insult and attacked them, making both of them guilty. If their invitation was like flaunted a red flag to a bull, if what they did necessarily invited from a normal man of human passions a breach of the peace, then they are responsible of that. When the gavel fell, 22 Klansmen and 11 townspeople were found guilty of charges with a two-year prison sentence. The town of Lilly went into a cold war with the Catholic community enraged by the trial results. Known Klansmen or believed to be sympathizers would find signs hanging from the telephone lines above their homes labeling them Ku Kluckers. But when the imprisoned townspeople were released, their return home was met with a loving welcome. The riot had been quickly buried from memory for more happier times. Although Klan support would increase in 1925, afterwards membership of this iteration dropped sharply. Many consider the riot here in Lilly to have been the action that ultimately led to the downfall of this iteration of the Klan. Since then, Lilly's been a mainly peaceful town. Right now the population is about 900. And there isn't a lot really for a while that really remembered this particular event. Fortunately, the town and its historical society have put out not just this marker, but several markers around town commemorating the history of this prosperous community. And I highly recommend, if you're in the Altoona area, take a trip down here to Lily. I think there's about six uh, plaques, I could be mistaken on that number, dedicated to the history of this town. And it's a nice walk around here. Thank you guys for watching Readout Productions. If you have any interest in what you saw here, be sure to hit the like button down below. Let me know in the comments if there's any other information I missed or goofed up. I tend to all the time. I am an amateur historian. Quotes an amateur. I don't cre I don't say I am the authoritarian speaker on all this. I'm all, I am a student of history myself. If you enjoyed this video, I'd highly recommend subscribing to see more from us. We do videos on all sorts of history, primarily in Western Pennsylvania and military history. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll be seeing you in the next video, whenever we make one.